Well, welcome back to the Lockdown Tactics podcast. This is one I'm really looking forward to. Snoddy has managed to conjure up a few of his old teammates and an ex, I believe, lookalike manager in Brian McDermott. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to pass you over to Snoddy to introduce everyone. <laughs> Can't believe you've given him a McDermott shout. Um, no, boy, they listen. Uh, it's um, I've, I've obviously been excited for this for a for a few days and uh, leading up to this, we've uh, I've managed to get a few of my teammates and and a, and a guy who um, I've been interviewed with many times. The connection of Leeds um, and one of my uh, ex teammates who was who was one of the best finishers and strikers um, that I've played with. Um, and especially I guess who we were trying to get in for you know a different country, which we're having a bit of difficulties, but hopefully he joins us a little bit later. So welcome to the show, Jermaine Beckford and Phil here. Hey, what's happening? How's Hi going? guys. How's By the way, I'm gonna to have to I'm gonna to have to start Snoddy. I'm ditching you as my co-host this week. I'm ditching yep. you, I'm bringing in Phil. I need someone with a Leeds knowledge. I'm <laughs> not I've had enough of you. I'm getting rid of you. I've had enough of you, mate. You've come to the wrong to. place. <laughs> well, let's get going. Um, what a what a season it's been for Leeds United um, this season. You must be delighted to see your your team back in the, in the top flight. Absolutely. Who's that to me or to Phil? Just forever. I was just, just Phil, you're, Phil. You're pretty good at these sort of things, so you can sit there in the corner for a minute. <laughs> I am. Um... <laughs> Sorry, mate. I love you. I love you. Um, yeah, it's been a phenomenal season. Um, but it was it was quite surprising as well, taking into account how last season ended. You know, the heartache at, uh, against Derby over two legs in the semi final. Um, the key, I think, for for the current success is keeping hold of the core of the team that we had for the, the duration of last season. Um, and Marcelo Bielsa, obviously standing on another year, was was. It, uh, mate, for me, I think that's been the best signing for for Leeds in a in a long, long time. So, for you, you know, you've been you've obviously been, been watching as well and, and writing a lot about it. How impressive have Leeds been this season? They, they've been impressive for two years. It's like Jermaine said; it, it was a, a proper kick in the teeth the back end of last year. But they they should have gone up last season, and they, I still think we're the best team in the league um, in Bielsa's first year. Uh, but it's just been a masterclass of coaching. You know, it's masterclass of tactics and masterclass of how to take players and improve them and how to build a good team without spending a huge amount of money and without dipping into the, the transfer market. And, I mean, I, I kind of always felt that when if and when Leeds got promoted, they were going to have to do it by smashing the championship to bits. And it, it kind of didn't feel like that during the running. It was, it was tense right the way up to the end, but... Now that it's finished, it's the finished ten points clear of West Brom. You no, know, they're, they're first in for every, any statistic you want to look at um, in terms of their performance and the anal analysis. They're, they're top of the tree, um, best side in the division without any argument. And it's been last two years have been absolutely sensational. Robert, for you, you know, you've, you've obviously you're in the Premier League. Um, what will Leeds need to improve the games you've seen? What will they need to improve um, when they come up? Do you know what? Um, just to obviously two lads, Jermaine and, and Phil talk about it there. It's um, they've obviously been up close and, and seen Leeds a, a lot more. Every time I've watched them, boy, they just seen them for for, for obviously the the game point of view and, and watching the games. They don't look as if they need to improve their health a lot. I just think what they'll probably want is to add a bigger squad um, and probably more firepower because that's what the Premier League is all about. I think you need to try and have. Um, the lads in the final third that they, they can create the difference. You can create as much chances as you possibly want. But if you've not got lads to, you know, take the chances and, and be clinical in the Premier League, then you'll find yourself, you know, you might be playing great. Because Norwich, um, Norwich this season, uh, for me, they, they played some great stuff at the start of the season. I don't know if you remember when they, they played Liverpool and, and they, you know, everybody was like, you know, why are Norwich playing Liverpool, try to pass them off the park. And then they played City, and I think they beat City, Man City, um, a couple of weeks later. So, you know, Leeds will come in with that um, that enthusiasm, that energy. Um, and, you know, the, the fan base, as, as we all know, it's, it's it's one of the best in the world. It's uh, The fans are um, incredible there. Uh, the relationship with the, with the fan and the player, you know, when they're, when they're doing well, there's, there's probably, they're up there with the best of them. So it's... Um, it's a fantastic football club. It's it's a it's very fanatical, but I think you know they'll be the twelfth man in stages, so they'll be they'll be wanting the fans to return quicker 
um, than anything, I suppose. So I just think they'll probably be looking to add a bit of, a bit of firepower. But the, I, want to ask, I want to ask Jermaine just on the subject. Uh, I think it was they'd only been promoted two days um, and uh, all the critics were coming out with Patrick Bamford and they were saying, you know, is, I don't think he's the answer and stuff. It's not that, for me, I don't think it's the question of, is he the answer? Pat, Patrick Bamford's up as a goal scorer. He can score. He fits into Bielsa's style, his philosophy. But do you think that Leeds need to add more striking options, more, you know, to give Patrick a, a hand, uh, probably first and foremost? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think he's got what it takes to, to cut it in the Premier League, especially with this Leeds United squad, this Leeds United team, and the way Marcelo Bielsa likes to operate. So, something that, that Patrick Bamford's been getting a lot of slack for. Um, not just this season, but last season as well, it, uh, is his lack of goals. So he doesn't necessarily score a hat full of goals every single game or every week or whatever, but he offers so much in terms of his work rate, in terms of his positioning and bringing other players into the game. Like for me, he would be an, an absolute dream to play alongside because he does all the donkey work and I get all the plaudits for putting the ball in the back of the net, which is the easy bit. You know, that I sounds a bit like what Snoddy. That sounds like Snoddy. No, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> see, guys, guys, I know, I know, we're speaking right now about you know Patrick Bamford and that, but I want to, I want to get right into the, the the main man himself, the manager. What has he done? His lifestyle. What has he done around Leeds, um, around the football club to change it? And what kind of character is he? And it, Phil, you can you can take us away in that one. If I think back to the time when um, Snoddy and Jermaine were playing at Leeds, it, it, you always had the kind of hope every season that they were going to do something big, particularly in the Championship, that it was going to happen. But there was never really that underlying confidence about it. They had a lot of quality players, so particularly in that season with Grace in 2010-11 when you should have got to the playoffs, the front end of that team is, is probably every bit as good as the front end of Bielsa's. And I think there are loads of players in that team that he would have liked to have worked with um, Rob included, but Grado and, and Becchio and so on. But the difference with Bielsa is that people have actually been able to believe in this and, and to have the faith that it's going to happen. And, and even though it fell apart at the back end of last season and literally in the last couple of games, it, it there was no suggestion that anybody wanted him to go. I think there was kind of unanimous support for him to stick around. And, and I was saying earlier about his coaching. I mean, a lot of the players who are playing under him are players who had finished 13th in the season before he came in. And I think to most of us, we kind of thought that a clear out of that squad was going to be inevitable, particularly with somebody like him coming in. But he, before he took the job, everybody knows this, but he, he sat in Argentina and he watched every game that Leeds had played in the season before he, he took the job. And he went through the squad and he worked out who he was going to keep, who was going to go. And the core of players that he wanted to keep was huge. You know, he looked at them and thought, I, I can make a lot of these better. And actually, we can be a considerably better team than we are. And they have done it, you know, they have made some signings. They spent seven million quid on Bamford. The one thing I would say in Bamford's defence is he has scored sixteen goals this season. Uh, and to be honest, the, the way he con his goals panel as well. He's had yeah. four chops off by the Dubia. So that takes him up to twenty already. No, this is it. Um, and I mean, there's nobody else that leads who's in double figures. Own goals is out behind him, you know, I think on nine at the minute. Um, so, and even if he wasn't scoring, Bielsa would play him regardless because it's all about the process and it's all about the structure of the team rather than a question of who's finishing it off from, from six yards. But the other thing as well is that the City have just fallen in love with him. You know, they, they love what he's like. They love what he's about. They love his kind of lack of ego um, and the fact that he, he delivers in the way that he's supposed to you know he says he's going to do X and he does X um, never deviates from his plan always has confidence in it and he's done something that nobody else has really looked like doing since 2006 I know they got to the playoff final in um, 2006 but that was not a great Leeds team that at all um, this has been a, a really really special team and it's no small way down to the fact they've got a really special coach What's impressed you most about him Jimmy? His relentlessness, his he his eye for detail. He leaves nothing to chance. Um, honestly, he analyzes absolutely every minuscule detail, and he he puts so much faith in what he does and what he believes in. You can't help but see what he's doing and see what he's saying, and become infected with with that determination and drive that he has. I think that's been a major major key. Um, you know, Bielsa goes for walks in Weatherby in his Legion United tracksuit. He's going to get recognised regardless wherever he goes. But 
you know, he's he's so grounded. He walks from his house to the training ground, regardless of the weather, um, just mulling things over in his mind. And when you see things like that as in your manager, you can't help but think to yourself, wow, he's going above and beyond to make sure that he is successful in everything that he's doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a bit of that. Let me see what happens if I push myself that extra 5%. And then you see it in the players, every single player. As Phil mentioned there, this is the same Leeds United squad, pretty much, as the one that finished 13th in the championship. You know, yeah. last season just missed out via, via the second leg of the, of the playoffs. This, this season absolutely demolished it with, with a couple of games to go. So for, for somebody to, to put so much thought, energy and... Um, and determination into his, his process, I think it naturally just rubs off on everybody else. I think that's the biggest thing that he's, he's bought. See, see on that, just to come in there, see, see in terms of the, the city, the, the you know, the culture you brought him, do you think, obviously, results helped, um, you know, to, to build that connection, everything, but do you feel as if the way he has approached Leeds and, as you say, they're walking to the house, I don't think he's over the top in terms of the, the, the houses he stays in and the way he goes about his business. So do you feel as if, because... The way he is um, is, is totally galvanised the whole city as, as such because you know as a fanatic, um, you know football city. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, go on, Phil. Go on. Yeah, it, it definitely has. Um, I think you're right about results. I mean, if it hadn't worked under him, then people would probably have looked at him living in a flat in Weatherby and walking about the streets in Leeds United tracksuit and considered them to be eccentric and. A bit off the wall, and and you would you would probably look at it as reasons why it hasn't worked. But he, he, I think he sees a lot in Leeds that he saw in Newell's Old Boys, his first club back in Argentina. He, he likes the working class city, he likes the ethos, and he he likes the fanaticism. Um, I mean, is it what Jermaine was saying about his attention to detail? It's it's baffling, really. Like it, someone was telling me that he's got a he's got um, dossiers obviously on every club, and and the one on Luton apparently includes eight pages on their third choice goalkeeper, whose percentage chance of playing this season is literally zero, barring you know injuries and so on. But just desperate to have all that information so that he never he never gets caught out. I mean, I was going to ask all, all three of you really what, what you think you would have made of the way that he the, the kind of body fat limits and the weight limits and the, the fitness targets that he sets for the, the players because I, I mean we're right now I mean, it would have, it, it, it would have killed me I'll tell you that well I, I'm Phil I'm sorry I'm going to have to move that question on because I ain't talking about <laughs> weight in my own podcast that's for sure <laughs> but see, see on that and I've got Stoddy Stoddy on that when you went to Leeds at first as a young boy, you, you've spoke about having to adapt. You had to adapt the way you were when you came down from Scotland to Leeds at first because of what it was, the football club and everything. You felt as if to be a success, you had to change. Looking at the Leeds players, as you say, what did you say, Jermaine, 13th two seasons ago, there's not been a lot changed um, in terms of the personnel, but within that, um, you know, body fats and stuff like that, you can see they're a total different team. The fitness levels went through the roof. What what goes into that? Like as I said, sorry, going back to your time when you had to change and everything, and then look at it now. That that lead squad is um, it's, it's known for um, how fit they are and the the physical condition they're in, how um, how together they are as a team. I speak to Liam Cooper on it as well, and, and he, he just says, you know, he's trying to get us to buy into his way and make us believe he's so similar to Pellegrini. Uh, and they've got that sort of South American uh, approach to it that's like we used to train, boy, they like you would not believe. And uh, I remember Pellegrini coming to me and, um, you know, the big blow up, like uh, you put Jermaine for the free kicks and he, he came yeah. to me and obviously I was travelling for uh, Villa and back, so I was eating at the services, so I'd probably put on a bit again. And uh, and he comes to me and he goes, Robert, do you want uh, do you want to be involved this season, or do you want to still be looking like the mannequin uh, over there, the big <laughs> mannequin over there? And I was like, uh, I want to be involved. He's like, well, you need to, you know, you need to lose some some weight, and you need to work hard. And I was like, I says the working hard part. I says I, I can do that, Gaffer. I says, but you know, I need to, I need to know that you know I'm all on 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 your uh, side that I you know I get that chance. So. But it comes back to what Phil's saying. He, he's obviously kept a lot of those boys, but he's promised them that, you know, the rotation within the squad, that everybody will get, you know, a certain chance. And if boys are doing well, he'll look after them. You can see the connection he's got with, um, 
Hernandez, he, he just, you know, he's always got his arm around him. He's always trying to, he just knows the attention to detail that he goes into. Boy, that he knows the full ins and outs about how each player work and how what's best for them. Jermaine, don't mind me saying this, but Jermaine was always that 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 player for me that he was the main man. And if he felt like the main man, you were getting you were getting the best of Jermaine. You know, he didn't need anybody coming in and try to tell him he was the main man. And, and if sometimes we would sit back, and I said this to you, Boydy, before we come in, that some of the things that Jermaine used to do, I, I would like... What, what what has he just done there? You know, something he'd dink the keeper for like 40 yards. And you've probably seen it, Phil, where yeah. he finished with his left foot, his right foot. And it was easy for me as, as being a, like an attacking player, whereas I'd have a couple of options, chop back, uh, dink it at the back post for, or a cut in off the left. And no, 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 let's... No, I know you're worrying about a chop back, but give me two minutes. It would have been chop, 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 chop. Nah, that's what it is. It was chop. I, I was like, I was like Chuck Norris. I was just chopping everybody all over the place. <laughs> the um, not and and I think that the full the full thing is for me was it was it was an easy process where you would kind of cut inside and you would find your men running between the lines. That was one of my favourites because every time I saw you on the left on the right wing, I knew if, as soon as you pull it back onto that left foot, that one pass every single time without fail is going in behind the defenders. And I know if I'm on my bike and I'm ready for it, nobody's catching me. You always you have mean, to... You know, you, you know what, like, the Premier League is, right? And and I'm I'm going to throw it out there. You know what, like, the Premier League is? You yeah. you understand how, you know, different it is for the championship. It's when, when you look at, obviously, the strengths that you had and what we're talking about, do you feel as if Leeds United needs somebody like that that's going to run beyond and get in behind? Because the defenders... You know, it's it's a it's so different with yeah, the Premier you know. League. You don't get as as many chances, and you've yeah. you've obviously played, and you and you and you understand what I'm talking about, and you realise that the chances are so, um, you know, so fine, so minute that you think to yourself, you I need to take that chance. So they need to have different options for me. What, what, what do you think? I I do you know what I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, I think what they need to do is have the players that are playing just behind the focal point, who is Patrick Bamford, um. Pablo Hernandez, um, Costa, you've got Klitsch, you've got uh, Jack Harrison. There's four, five, six different boys that you've got that you can rotate. But as soon as Patrick Bamford pulls the centre-halves out of position, you need those guys bombing in and, and filling those gaps, filling those spaces. And I think that's something that they work a lot on. Like I've seen one or two training sessions and they work a lot on the third-man run, the fourth-man run even. So it's something they, they've definitely targeted and and... You know, I think having a, a striker that likes to be direct, that runs in behind, you can't defend against pace. Like, you, you, there's no way you can defend against pace. So as long as you've got somebody that uses their brain a little bit in terms of their starting positions, that, that ball in behind is such a, a clinical part of, of, I think, this, this Leeds United side. I think it, it would be tragic if they didn't bring somebody else in. I'm a free agent as well, by the way. Just, just. <laughs> <laughs> He's rolling back the years, rolling back the years. Look, two, Phil, two. Phil, I want to, Phil, I want to bring you in on in, in that as well. See, in terms of the recruitment process, yeah. what do you think uh, Leeds will do when they come up? Will it be a case of they'll go and spend big or will they, will they, will they look to bring in maybe younger players or, or a work in progress and, and make players better again? Yeah, younger players. I mean, the, the, the club, all the indications of the club have been that they'll have a look at the at the best of the players in the championship. And like for example, two of the players that they really like are Watkins and Ben Rama. At Brentford, and I think that that kind of taps into what um, Snoddy was saying, and, and Jermaine as well. Just plenty of pace in both of those two great finishers. Something a little bit different to Bamford, and you know they're, they're not going to be cheap, and it'll be difficult that if Brentford go up. But um, they would they would sort of fit, and not only because of their attributes, but also because they're they're pretty low maintenance, if you know what I mean. Bielsa quite likes that. He's not big on egos, and he's not big on on big reputations at all. He just likes players who are going to fit into his system, who are going to be able to follow his orders to, to the letter. Um, and the fact, you know, you, you saw it last summer with Pontus Janssen going to Brentford. Janssen's one of the best defenders in in 
the championship. And as it happens, they managed to land on a better one in, in Ben White from Brighton. But that was a big call and it was quite a small fee at, at £5 million. But Janssen just didn't fit and Bielsa had got tired of him and, and felt that he needed a change. And that's kind of how it is. So he would rather have low maintenance guys with a lot of talent and a lot of potential that he can work on than, for example, a, a Cavani or somebody hideously expensive with a, with a huge reputation. So I think that's probably the way they'll go. See, see, when you speak there about about um, recruitment process, and I, I know, Snoddy, you've you've obviously moved from clubs as well, Jermaine. How important do you think it is that that Leeds get it spot on? Um, you know, whether they return to the, the the Premier League next year. I think I don't think they're far off it right now. If I'm honest with you, I think they're very close to it. Uh, to to being able to maintain the Premier League status first and foremost. Um, but if you if you look at the the amount of research and, and energy they put into um, their oppositions, the work that, that the, the the pages, the booklets that they they read and write on individual players, as as um, Phil mentioned there, the third choice goalkeeper of Luton, you know they had they had eight pages on him. If they do that kind of research into the players that we're looking at getting for this following season and beyond. Um, the, uh, mate, it's, it's going to be nothing short of of perfect for for the team. He's not afraid to make big decisions when it needs to be, um, especially with the the guys that he's currently got in the team. Like I remember Patrick uh, Patrick Bamford scored a goal. Um, I can't remember who it was. Leeds were winning one nil. Patrick Bamford scored the win, uh, scored the goal in the first half, and he was taken off at half time because he wasn't doing the other side of the game that Bielsa saw as far more clinical and critical so big decisions he's not afraid of making um and he's not going to bring anybody in that's going to upset the the rest of the mentality of the squad like they're such a close-knit team squad unit it's similar to ours um snods when we got promoted very similar um bunch of guys there's no morons in there there's no body in there that's hard work everybody gets on like a house on fire. So, you know, I think that's something that they're, they're also very cautious about not wanting to, to upset the, the, the current squad. You'll be amazed as well at the size of squad that he goes with because he likes to kind of roll with sort of 18, 20 senior pros tops. He doesn't want any more yeah. than two players per position and, and ideally he likes players to be able to spread across positions so Ailing, for example you can double up at centre back and Ben White can play um, defensive mid when, when Phillips is, is out uh, so I think they'll probably do four or five tops I don't think they'll I don't think they'll go wild and I don't I certainly don't think he'll rip it up in any way I, I think he intends for this his team next season to be very similar to how it is now so I'll see you on that see you when you speak to a lot of managers, um, they speak. You know, they'll, they'll talk about it's important to get the players on side as um, as one of the key elements of being a successful manager. But it's also really important to manage up the way. And what I mean is the board, the chief exec, and people like that. How is uh, Bielsa's relationship with um, the owners, the, the you know the chief exec and stuff like that? Is, is every I means Jermaine says there the players and the management staff is everybody the, the club um, from top to bottom all in it together. They are, and one of the reasons they are is because he's by far the, the biggest personality at the club. He's bigger than bigger reputation and and more respected in the game than any of the players at Leeds, um, and and equally anybody in the boardroom. You've got Radrazani as owner. You've got Angus Kinnear as chief exec, and Victor Alter as director of football, who who pretty much manages Bielsa. And they can you know they can fight like cat and dog those two, but they always have a way of of smoothing it over afterwards and and forgetting what's been said. And he is difficult, and he is demanding Bielsa. You know it's not easy um, keeping somebody like him happy but I think one of the reasons that it's worked is because it, at a championship club and a level where he, he probably shouldn't really be managing it, everybody would think of him as, as more elite than this there's nobody who's going to cross him and there's nobody who's, who's going to make things difficult for him and I think everybody in the dressing room can tell that they're, they're kind of blessed to be having this for, for two years in, in that division and I mean even you know going back to when um, Jermaine and, and Rob were, were at Leeds. He never felt with 
Gary McAllister or with Simon Grayson or to be honest any of the coaches who followed after that that they ever had total autonomy or, or total authority at the club and Bielsa is probably the first person who's come in and been able to run the club and to do exactly as he pleases with no dissent and it can be a coincidence on that basis that it's worked for him Yeah he's, he's working under an amazing uh, owner as well Andrea Ragrizani so you know Andrea's got the utmost respect um for him also so and that that ultimately um shows you know when you've got an owner who who trusts wholeheartedly in your process in in your mindset your mentality and your game plan it's it's only going to end one way and i've seen as as phil mentioned there there's been a few times where victor Orta and and uh marcelo bielsa are, are, have been caught up in a, a little bit of war of words literally 10 minutes and you think to yourself wow this is going to end in a proper fight here and then they <laughs> end up hugging it out afterwards laughing and joking and smiling and high-fiving obviously not now but prior to the uh the lockdown etc um and it was it's it's so bizarre to see but that's like those are the kind of relationships that that are solid that are strong you know the ones where it's almost like brotherly love you can have the biggest argument with your brother and then out of nowhere, you just look at each other, you catch a glimpse of each other's eye and you understand, look, I, I know what this was. It, it wasn't anything personal. You're just trying to get your point across. Same with me, two stubborn people coming together. And then they they, they acknowledge each other, laugh and joke, and then off they go and have an argument about something else. So it's really funny to see. Someone, someone once described it to me as two levels of insanity colliding with Bielsa and, and Arthur. And, and they were saying that, like to watch them argue from time to time you, you would think that they're never going to speak to each other ever again um but it just seems to work it's kind of like that latin temperament that um eventually they, they always meet on the same page um and i think i think he also would have every bit as much respect for Arthur as, as Arthur does yeah. for him because the whole thing has just worked so i want to bring you back in on this see see as a, as a premier league footballer right now what Looking at Leeds, and I know you've got a special relationship with the fans and you've played with the club and everything, but there must be other boys at West Ham looking at the same. I'm delighted Leeds are back up. I can't wait to go back to Ellen Road. Yeah, boy, it's um, as I said to you, uh, Jermaine knows it's a, it's a special, it's a special club within the the English game and sort of worldwide. Uh, I realised that when I became uh, captain of the club in my, my last year there, that it was um, it was huge because uh, I've done a lot of interviews all over the world and. I was, as I said, he didn't realise like the, the previous captains and how how hard, obviously, how hard work it was. So it was. Um, you, you find out about it uh, when you when you do arrive and how special it is. And when it were obviously when I when I went there, I had a a, a list of you know massive Scottish names that it did really well. So I was thinking, you know, no pressure, get in there and and try your try your best. And and, and you get a connection. Jermaine had it with the fans. I remember. A, a game with Jermaine and and the fans were singing his name all the way through the game and 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 even probably him after the game he's probably thought Jesus you know why did I leave this this connection to be loved um, within the football and game is is a, is a special feeling and you know when those Leeds fans uh, when they get that connection with you there's um, uh, you, you know fine well uh, what the club means and you know they'll back you uh, even when you're having bad games so I think. Is is us, you know, at, at West Ham when when we've seen it, I, I've been rooting for Leeds to get back to the uh, the big time for you know many years now since I, since I left because it's a special feeling. I still speak to a lot of the people that um, that I had their staff related uh, as well. So it's a, it's a it's a special club. I still speak to the, the dinner ladies and stuff. Jermaine will know quite well, and it's uh, it's just it's just that feel when you walk through the building. It's you know they make you feel at ease. And I left there being a sort of 18, 19 year old kid, and um, they made everything a hell of a lot. Um, better for me, and I remember a story boy day when I when I first arrived. I think it was David Prutton who you'll probably know for Sky now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I arrives and the lads used to give me stick for this. I arrived in a Hyundai Coupe, red leather in there. Jermaine's probably <laughs> Jermaine probably remembers it fine. And uh, I remember David Prutton. Uh, I've parked the car there, and uh, uh, David Prutton came out. He's he's leaving the same time as me, and he turns to me and he goes. One of those fucking young kids is parked next to my car. It was my car, right? And I blocked him in. And I was like, oh, no, what do you like? It? <laughs> and it was my car. And I was like, oh, no. I said, I need to get rid of this. And then 
I got myself, I don't know how I got it, boy, did I? But I, I don't know if you remember as well, Jimmy. I got myself a nice white Mercedes C Class. And I, I know when they as soon as it, as soon as it arrived, I don't know what it was. The boys were like, Who's ordered a Magaluf taxi? And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Magaluf <laughs> taxi, that's right. Oh, I yeah, that that was, that was um, you know, the introduction of the English game and ever since, obviously, we've been here 12, 13 years and, you know, the, the, the feeling every time I'm back to Leeds, I don't know how Jermaine feels, but it's a, it's a, it's a different feeling. You go back there and you think, this is this is very, very... I've always had a good connection with, with clubs I'd, I'd played it and uh, that that feeling leads us, leads us one. I don't know, how do you feel, Bex, when you go back, when you went back there as a player playing against so how was How was that feeling? Mate, it's, it's unbelievable. Do you know what? You've got all the, the familiarities, like you mentioned before, the girls in the kitchen, Gladys and Izzy. You've got all the, yep. the men who are still the same, Chris Beasley, like all the security guys and girls. Are, it's still very familiar. So when you go back there as a player, an opposition player, um, you walk in the tunnel, you go down the, the touchline into the changing rooms, you walk past the home changing rooms, which is yep. kind of, it's obviously second nature because that's what it, it's all familiar again, isn't it? Yep. You walk past it, you say hello to everybody. Sticks is still there as well, um, yep. and then go into the the away one, and you sit in the the away changes, and you just think to yourself, "Wow, yeah. this is crazy." I, yeah, it's a crazy I, feeling. Could, yeah. I, could I just it's jump in here and say? We used to joke and say that after Jermaine left from Leeds, any time he came back and played, he was always Leeds man of the match. It was like it was ninety minute ninety minutes of applaud, <laughs> applauding the applauding the cop, and you'd go right. Yeah. You're doing your match ratings afterwards. You go Beckford ten out of ten. Excellent. That's yeah, yeah. that's great. But but like you two, I, I don't mean fortunate because you deserved it. But you were you were lucky that you went with your reputations intact. So when you go back, people like to see you. You know, I've I've seen guys yeah. like Steve Morrison come back to Leeds who, you know, never never quite did it and never quite got to understand the supporters they never understood him and it's it's hard going it's hard going Ellen Road when you're you're in that position. So see, see, see if I take the two years back to that see in terms of leaving how difficult was it or what was the story? Um I will start with you Jimmy and like you know leaving a football club because when you've got that special connection you're scoring gold week and out to leave it, it does it's it, it's it's a strange feeling. It's it was a horrible feeling. It was a horrible feeling. I didn't I didn't want it to be the case. I wanted to after the first week of, of signing for Leeds and seeing what Leeds United's about, I, I didn't ever I didn't ever want to leave. I didn't ever want to leave. But you know, through things that happen, uh it, it becomes a, a choice that is no longer solely yours. Um and I had another opportunity to to taste the Premier League with with Everton as well, which is another huge club, um, very similar in 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 a lot of aspects to, to Leeds, in terms of the family aspects. The it's it's you 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 feel like you're part of the family instantly, and that's exactly what I felt when I I signed at Leeds. When I left, it was it was difficult, man. It really was. I shed a lot of tears um, for all the people that I wasn't going to be working with on a daily basis again. Um, I'd miss everybody um, because that Leeds was Leeds was a place that helped me to to learn and to grow up and to become an, an adult. I had to grow up quickly. I, I I was 22 years old when I left London and moved up to to um, Headingley, which was probably the best place for a 22 year old boy to live <laughs> while he's on his own. He's very lovely, lovely. <laughs> But it was like you can't help but but miss every part of it. There's there's some parts that I never thought I'd miss, like the the gym, the swimming pool, because every time I got into either one of them, it was the hardest session I'd ever have in my life. And I didn't, yeah, I didn't appreciate those at the time. Looking back, I really enjoyed it, and it 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 helped to lay the foundations to to make me stronger mentally and physically and. You know that that part of me being growing up helped. It wouldn't have been the same if I'd been at any other club. And yourself, Robert, when you when you left? No, I was, I was going. I was going to say that uh, boy. Did, um, before you before you asked, is that leaving was was one of the hardest things I've ever done in, in my life. Um, you know, Jermaine talked about it there, and I knew so obviously speaking to him leading up to the decision where he was probably just 
dangling the carrot where it was, I think it uh, it was like, you know, smell of Saint Leeds, come on, up, up your offer, try and, you know, match, show me how much you love me. And I just don't think the club were probably at that uh, stage financially. Um, and it was a chance for him to go and further his career. And, um, you know, f- fair play to him for doing that because, you know, it was similar, it was so similar to myself where, it, you know, you, you took the risk by saying, I'm, I'm leaving a club here that I absolutely adore. I loved it. Um, they, they they took me down there and, and fully taught me how to live my life on you know what to do away from the park. Matty Pears, um yeah. worked with him in, in great length. Harvey Sharman, um, Perkins, the uh, Paul Perkins, the physio, um, you know Lego Head, Steve, um, that people like that. The um, these type of guys that you know you remember because it's your sort of core foundations. When you know introducing English football and they worked with me physically as well to try and get in. You know, a better condition because I had a lot of problems, uh, like hamstrings, boy day, and, and, and they sorted them out within a, f- a few months. And I think I played 59 games the first season, then 62 games the second season. And Jermaine tells you it takes its it takes its course on you. It's, it's tough going. Um, and for me, the only game that I think I never started or whatever I think it was, it was the last game against Bristol Rovers when we actually get promoted. You know, so that was. Um, that was that was that was a difficult process as well, but it was it was all one that you know we knew we were going to get through the gears to to get this you know great football club back where um, you know where we belong, and it's so fitting that you know um, we we we, we kind of obviously spoke to Jermaine like this, but to have you know the chat uh, about Leeds United and we we felt I've no spoke to him since I left as well as it is we we're all sitting here chatting on the table, and it's like. You know we've got their job, job, job done. Um, obviously, but me and Jermaine are only part of the squad. But there's always that that feeling inside that you know that part of your heart that you say to yourself, you know, I've loved um, my time there, but it doesn't mean it's over. Uh, you never um, say never. You just don't know what's in the future um, in terms of maybe me or Jermaine and I'll let you know maybe having you know, uh, get into coaching or just getting involved with the club and in, in, in somehow in, in the future. And it's, um, you know, because it's that club, it's, it catches you um, and it's so hard to let go. Part of, the, part of the reason that I think the supporters never had a problem with any of you going was that they totally understood your decision. Like, back then, the club had become pretty stable around that point, but stable was about the best thing you could say. And, you know, it was flat. It never felt particularly ambitious. The supporters weren't particularly having baits as, as owner. And, I mean, I've interviewed Jermaine for The Athletic and Luciano for The Athletic. I've spoken to Rob about this before. I've spoken to Max Grado, Johnny House, and both of whom went. And you all say exactly the same thing, which is basically, it was hard to believe in where the club were going. You know, it was hard to feel like the club had a plan or, or had a, a strategy that was going to get them promoted. Um, and... You know, ultimately, when when five, six, seven quality players say that, you can't all be wrong. You know, that was the general feeling, and and I actually think that when you were saying to people, look, th- there was just no ambition there. The supporters totally agreed with you. So, on that, Phil, how difficult has it been for someone who's been connected? The guys have obviously played, and they've got a special connection with the fans in that uh, the club. But for someone who's writing and been there, you know, sixteen year, I think you said mm. that you you started uh, covering Leeds. So, you know, you've went from. The glory days of you know Premier League, you know year after year, um, Europe to as low as, as as the first division, struggling in there, and then coming back up. So, what impact from a city point of view um, has that had from you know as I said right at the start till you know through the process and then back to it now? You can feel the buzz. I will. I always said to people that I was like Jonah because I joined the Union Post about. A month before they were relegated, um, and the first Leeds game I ever did was um, the 2006 playoff final that they lost to Watford, and after that it was insolvency and relegation to League One and everything else. And I said, when I left the Evening Post last summer, I said in a piece, now that I'm going, you'll you'll get promoted, this will be what does it for you. Um, and sure enough, there they go. But, I mean, the, the boys will both know that, that you know, in Leeds... It's by far the biggest focal point for the city. You know, it's not a big tourist destination, Leeds. It doesn't have a lot of the stuff that your oldie worldy cities like London or York or whatever else um, have in them and, and attract people from all over the world. But people know about Leeds United and, and have always known about Leeds United. And when it's drifting and, and when it's nowhere as a club, it, it, it's it's hard for people to take 
great interest in it. It's hard for the city to have any profile outside of its own its own region. Um, but you'll have seen, I mean, you'll all have followed it on social media um, since the promotion last week. The interest in them is just absolutely rife. And I know when any club goes up, you know, you, you get this little explosion of celebration and everything else. But I do think there's... There's so much more fascination about the fact that Leeds and Bales are back in the Premier League, what it's going to mean, what it's going to be like. Um, and it's, you know, it needed to happen eventually. I, I certainly think the league will be better for it. I don't think it was ever right to say that Leeds deserved to be at that level until they got it together in the way that they have for the last two years. If you don't have a plan and you don't have a strategy and if you don't invest properly, then you, you deserve what you get. But these these last two years have, have earned it ten times over. Um, and it's it's gonna be it's gonna be great next season. Jermaine and Phil, I mean, I know you've been around the football club. Um, can you understand why um, you know Leeds have, have struggled with the owners and the managers have had? It's, it's took you know the, the amount of years that it has because you know at the top level it's not in the boardroom, it's not been right. The managers have not been the right fit for the football club. Can you understand why it has took so long to get back? Yeah, Jermaine, you? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely do. It's um, as Phil uh, touched on there. It's having an owner and a manager with a direction with a, a direction they want to take the, the team in and having some sort of format that they want to follow the past owners haven't necessarily had that and they they almost hoped for a little bit of individual brilliance to to get them mm. into the premier league without actually realizing how it's going to be feasible for that to be the case um now we've got an owner with a vision. He said he wanted to get into the Premier League within five years. He, he managed to do it within three, which is amazing. And he's not talking about um, jumping straight from getting promoted to getting into the Champions League. He's not talking about that at all. I think that's going to be another aim of his over the next three to five years. Um, but he also has a manager who, who know a boardroom and a manager who know and understand what they want to see in their team, in their squad, how they want to play, the the, the type of football they like to see, etc., and the, the mentality of the players that they like to bring in. So there's a lot of um, a lot of direction, a lot of understanding from the top working its way down to show us, to show the fans, to show everybody else that the club have finally managed to find themselves on the right tracks, and you know. It looks like it's full steam ahead. I mean, a question I'd like to ask you both of you is: with, I don't mean emotionally, because obviously emotionally you'd probably like to stay there for for as long as you possibly could. But like professionally, Rob, did did you ever regret the fact that you went? Because it's hard for anybody to look at what you've done since you you left and think that it was the wrong decision. Um, good good question, Phil. I, I sometimes, uh, you know. Jermaine um, and, you know, uh, the, the rest of the lads, eh, Boydie will probably know this as well. Sometimes you need to go on your gut instinct and mm. it wasn't just off the cuff. It was, you know, seeing Jermaine go, uh, seeing uh, Johnny Housen leave. It was like, I, I, I was seeing the the people that was uh, described to me as part of the plan and the process mm. to get back to the Premier League. So seeing... Gradle, Gradle as well. Obviously Max as well, who for, for me was, was one of the best wingers in the, in, in the championship mm -hmm. so that was uh and we had a great relationship um and and sometimes it it, it leads um obviously when we were in league one it was a little bit different but in the championship i don't know about uh if you noticed this fall but they would always work to try and get me and max on the ball we try and make something mm -hmm. happen so i always felt really involved in the in the game every single time um as soon as a fullback uh, uh, got at his feet, he would always try and hit me early, and then I'd be trying to get me isolated for one v one. We tried that in in so many different um, occasions, and and it worked out. We were like, I think we beat QPR on, um, I think it was just after Boxing Day uh, or leading up to New Year. We, just we before beat, Christmas, yeah, yep. We 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 beat them, and then it was uh, it was very it was very difficult because we had a window where we didn't go and sign mm -hmm. the people that was going to get us there. So that I had the six months and we just went for setting that we just slowly, gradually, we actually missed out in the playoffs because, and to be honest, we, we, we weren't really good enough. Um, the league doesn't lie. So there is a regret, but it was a process, Phil, where, mm. you know, you have to, you get one chance in this, this uh, career and, 
and, and you look back and, and listen, if Leeds would have went and got promoted and, uh, you know, the next year or whatever, uh, there wouldn't have been anybody more happier because that relationship, you, you don't lose it in, in, in the connection, you, you don't lose it. You just almost need to focus on, you know, what's the right decision. Every window that comes and every footballer will look at this and they'd be, they'd be lying if they said they, they, they are. They look at it every window to say, you know, what's it's all in probably six months blocks now mm-hmm. when they say, am I playing? Am I am I happy here? Is, is the structure right? Is, is everything moving the way that, you know, that they're, they're saying? And and even you obviously learn probably when you're a little bit older if you're not playing as much, then you you realise that you know you can't play every game. You need to be a good teammate. You need to be there supporting the boys, and and that does come into the factor when you get a little bit older. So that that happens at me now at um, at West Ham where you're not playing as much. I watched the lads the first part of the season, and then you do your bit probably midway through the season, and then obviously it's come back again that. You know, I've had an injury towards the back end of the season, but I'm the first one there wishing the boys good luck. I'm the one uh, there that's in the change room. So there's a different process and there's a different role as you get a little bit older. And Jermaine says this, but the the, the big thing I said to Jermaine before before we came on a few days ago was, I don't know why, um, and I've said this to Boydie as well, at, probably at Rangers, but I don't know why, Phil. I don't know what how you would, would think it, but if I was Leeds United, I'd be looking. There, there'd probably no better striking option to get him and his coach striker coach I think every team needs it um, and I've spoke to managers as such on this and it's like that's that's their role because the hardest thing these lads will tell you is putting the ball in the back of the net and they too did it on several occasions many occasions and you know if you can get lads in England do it with the superior striker uh, Alan Russell uh, the boy who is Scottish lad and and you see Harry Kane Rashford these lads taking you know his techniques and 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 no disrespect to him, these two had a better goal scoring record than, than that lad and, and and playing with both of them and, and seeing them up close. I think for Leeds United, especially getting the chance to get back, I would I would be busting you know my chops to try and get somebody like Jermaine and his a striker mm-hmm. coach to try and work with the strikers, um, to try and get them, you know, little cute little um runs, as Jermaine said, your starting point is you know where you're gonna be running, where you're gonna be moving, getting across the front defender. Boy, they did the role so many times, finishing what what strikers have for me felt is um they hit it earlier than anybody I've ever seen. Like they just hit it early and and, and I've tried it and I, I can't I can't get off the ground. I don't know what else and, and I'm going like so then as you learn about strikers and, and I'll, it's probably the best way is uh, best to touch on this and me playing wide and I played on the right. I know strikers used to get mad with me when I'd play and probably Grado as well and these lads and he'd say, just cross the ball. And I'm like, no, I want to chop him and I want to chop him again and I want to look good <laughs> doing it. And the older you get, I don't do that at West Ham now. I've, I've not done that for, for years because they were right all along and I was wrong. Um, and, and, and me and Chris had a chat with a couple of young kids and it was like, build that relationship with your striker early. You know, if Jermaine is going to make the run, then play him, you know? Because if you're building that relationship with him, boy, they, and you and you get that connection, you're 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 one step ahead of the opposition straight away. So if it is that he wants it front post or Jim um or Luciano dink to the back post, then build that relationship. Um and and boy, I'll ask you, did did you speak to wingers? Did you did you speak to your you know attacking midfielder or your other strike partner? Did you talk? I know you, Jermaine, you and Becky used to talk quite a bit. Did, boy, did, what did what did you do in that instance? Did you did you always try and brief the lads before the season starts or whatever or where you're going to be? Well, well on that, so I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit. Um, I know people say that finishing is the hardest thing in the game, but I think Jermaine will, will back me up on this one. It's not. Some people just make it look hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Some people just make it look hard, mate. But, but listen, I totally under. <laughs> You're right, Jimmy. It's easy. That's easy. What easy did they part. do them, Phil? Sitting there all smug with 300 gold each like other. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, I think, I think that, you know. Jermaine will be the first, the, the most important things, your teammates, you can be a finisher, you can get yourself in the position, but that's all, it's, it, it, it goes out the window if you don't have people there to find you. And I think as strikers, the earlier um, the ball is delivered, um, you know, Jermaine was, was faster than me. Um, I, I, I didn't depend on pace to get away from people. I was, you know, it was that two, three yard movement quickness. Um, and what I needed was people to see early runs, to see the um, my movement. I knew I had a, a 
connection with my midfielders. I had a special connection with Kenny Miller, especially at Rangers and Scotland. Um, but I mean, I think when I look back at my successful period as a career in my career um, with people like Pedro Mendes, Stevie Davis, Barry Ferguson, um, and then when you bring in, I mean, we didn't really play with, with out and out wingers as such at Rangers. Um, it was more. Um, you know, that we, we tried to probe because a lot of people would maybe sit in against us with three at the back, uh, five defenders, two sitting midfielders. Um, so it, 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 it can become difficult to break things, uh, to break teams down. But when you've got that connection, as you speak about there, with your midfielders and your movement is so crucial. Um, and it may be, you, you know, you're coming away to get back across people, um, get your arm up and, and, you know, protect yourself so that you're strong enough, um, you know, to get your shots away. And I, and I, I think you've touched on it there. You know, when I see strikers, and it, and it, it really, really, really annoys me that, that when you when you see strikers take touch, 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 and that's what you try to say to wingers as well. Just take it out of your, your feet and deliver the ball. And it's the exact same with strikers. Get a touch. The quicker you can get the shot away, the better. And people will always say to you, you know, when you get into positions, and I think Jermaine will probably back me up on this one as well, when you get into positions, what do you aim for, you know? For me, it was always aim for the goalie because nine times out of ten, you won't hit him. And the closer it is to him, if it's, it's very difficult, you know, goalkeepers want to dive and make big saves. And um, But when it's close to him, it's difficult to stop. And the easy, sorry, the earlier you hit it, um, the more chance you've got of scoring. But I'm the first to admit, you know, yeah, you've scored um, 300 goals in, in your career, but um, I would not have done it if it wasn't for my teammates. Just to, just to quickly go back to something Rob was talking about as well, you know, and players going from Leeds, just to give you an, an example, like last summer, Aston Villa were in for Calvin Phillips, um, and I, we knew that they were keen and we knew that they were looking at him and everything else, but I never realised how close it was to happening until I went to see Calvin on Monday for a piece that we did, and he was saying, look, I, I was pretty much at the point where I decided I was leaving. You know, in my head I was going, I just didn't want to say that because once I said it, it was all over and, and I knew that that they would they would sell me. Um, and in the end, he, he because he was wavering, the club said, "Look, we're, we're not going to do it." And and he stuck around, and he's gone up this season, and he's absolutely delighted that that he has. And I just I've no doubt at all that if this had been two thousand and twelve, he'd have gone, you know, because he would have looked at Leeds and he would have said, "I just don't see anything for me here. Like I don't see where this is going." But because it's Bielsa and because you've got this project, it's much easier to turn down what would have been really, really good money at Villa and, and would have been Premier League football there and then because you he, he kind of trust what's going on. And that's the difference. That's that's how it's changed in the past 10 years. See, see on that, uh, Jimmy, what was... I know Robert speaks about... Robert, you're getting your Sunday name. Um, I know I know, I know. Um, Stoddy speaks about that connection, but for you, who was... Like the, the special people, wingers, midfielders that you played with, especially in that Leeds team? Uh, there were a lot, but I would say Snod's definitely one of them. And Luciano, I think for, for, for me, those two were pivotal to, to the way my game was based. Because Snod and I would catch an eye, would see each other's eyes, little head movement, and then yeah. boom, off I'd go. The ball would get delivered perfectly as well when he decided he's had enough of chopping defenders. Um, <laughs> and then um, I'll, I'll be able to to get in on the back of it, or if there was a, a a long cross that comes up from the a long clearance or something that come up from the fullbacks or the goalkeeper, Luciano would say, "I'm going for this. Which side, left or right?" So I say inside, and then he'll head it in towards the the penalty spot, or outside, and he'll head it towards the uh, the edge of the 18 yard box. So I, I'd know exactly where to base my run, depending on what I'd said to to the guys or or the direction of the ball that was that it was travelling in. But it's it's vitally important to build that relationship with your wingers, with the the number ten that's playing behind you, or your fullbacks if they like to get across in early. I I was a massive fan of when my fullback, the left back or right back, have got the ball. Them just lifting the ball over the the opposition fullback, and I would make the run from the middle of the pitch, from the left centre half or the right centre half, in towards the channel, in behind that that fullback, because I know his he's not going to make it. You know, he's not going to make it not against my pace and me already knowing where the ball is going to end up. Um, so relationships are, are vitally, vitally important. Jimmy. You'll hate me. You'll hate me for this, Chris. But since Becky is not here, I'll I'll just read you something that that he said when I did a, a piece with him. He was talking about Jermaine, and and he said Jermaine was by far the player who understood him best, uh, intelligent player. Um, 
attacking a great attacking partner. But he said, the person I enjoyed playing with the most was Snodgrass. He always knew what my movement would be in the box, and I always knew when the right time was to make a run for him. Um, it felt like about 60% of my goals came from that connection, and with a small gesture or something simple like that, Snodgrass could see where he had to direct, direct the ball. And Rob can pay me for that later on. That's why his thighs were so big, though, because he was always having to go forward and back. Do you know what I mean? Because that's Stoddy was chopping. No, no, that's um, that's nice words, and and I just uh, I just I just wanted to touch, obviously, what um, Jermaine was saying there about his relationship with, with Becky. I, I, I obviously when I was there, I was sort of young young kid, and um, you're just learning about the game as such. But obviously, looking now as a sort of an older pro and 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 thinking back to the relationship they had, they were so close. Um, they had such a great relationship. They were always laughing and they understood each other so well. And I'll be honest with you, I've not seen that with two strikers all the way through my career. I've not seen it. Um, strikers are a different breed. And I don't, obviously, boy, they don't be you. But when, Jermaine, only time i ever seen Bex unhappy was when he never scored. Um, he was he was always the first in the morning, smiling, laughing. So nice with me when I, when I joined and... It was, you know, just this, just a great guy. And then you would see him switch when he didn't score, and I'm thinking, oh my god, he actually loves scoring. And then I realised probably a little bit more. I think I played number ten with him a few times, and one of the famous games was when we drew two two. I think uh, White Hart Lane. I think it was when you scored the late penalty, Jermaine. And then um, just, just that. It was always I was, I was slow. I was like snail's pace, and then I'd get in in little pockets and try to get turned. Because he was creating so much space for me, and you're not realising that until you get a little bit older. Because he was constantly just darting in behind people, trying to run, always on the last man. And it's until you probably get a little bit older, you realise how good those traits actually were. And I'll be honest with you, Phil, I, I would back those two, um, playing with them, and then playing with other strikers. I would back that partnership to want to be one of the best in the um, the Premier League um, right now in there pivotal points of their career because they were they were a hell of a partnership and one that probably because it was the sort of lower leagues as such, they didn't really get the probably the credit it deserves, but it was a special feeling and, and no no coincidence that they've got such a great relationship away for the field now and the fans love them.